is uh, the Distinguished Visiting Professor of Law at the University of Houston Health Law and Policy Institute, and is also an Adjunct Professor of Philosophy at the University of Texas in Austin. His academic background and professional background include a PhD in philosophy from Northwestern University, his Juris Doctorate from UCLA Law School, a PhD in psychoanalysis from Southern California Psychoanalytic Institute, and an honorary Doctor of Letters from Monmouth College. He's a fellow of the Hastings Center and a Ziff Fellow from 2009 to 2011. And I'd like you to join me in a warm welcome of Dr. Dr. Thank you, Jim. You've done a great job in organizing the interdisciplinary programs, and there are several other events. Uh, I hope some of you saw or heard Lisa Genova last week talking about Still Alice. It was a fantastic performance, and I'm sure I can't match it, but I will be talking about a little bit different things. Um, I have only one requirement, and that is that you visualize um, four boxes, okay? Uh, the four boxes are in this book, but uh, you, you can't see them. But there are four boxes in the back. And in the first box, it says medical indications. In the second box, next to it, it says patient preferences. And in the third box, it says quality of life. And the fourth box says contextual features. And what I'm going to be doing is talking about dementia, various dementias, and talking about it in the context of medical indications, patient preferences, quality of life, and contextual features. Uh, that's part of this book on clinical ethics that I co-authored with Al Johnson and Mark Siegler. And we're struggling right now to finish the eighth edition of this book, which was first published in 1982. But the four boxes are all that you need to think about. <laughs> in the 1980s, when Alzheimer's disease was beginning to be diagnosed more frequently, it actually was overdiagnosed. And I wrote an article with a psychiatrist in the 80s about the difference between diagnosing Alzheimer's disease and diagnosing depression. We had a lot of elderly patients in Los Angeles uh, who were deeply depressed, and they would sometimes be misdiagnosed as having Alzheimer's disease. And one lady was brought to UCLA by the police because she'd been living in her car behind her house because she had a delusion, a delusion that the house was unsafe. And she had other kinds of hallucinations. And she would stay in her car, and her neighbors would bring food. And finally, they realized that this was getting pretty messy. And they called the police, and they brought her to UCLA. And she was totally mute. And at first thought was, well, maybe she has Alzheimer's disease, and she just didn't know what she was doing. She was confused. And they were able to get some medical records and decided that it wasn't really Alzheimer's disease. It was psychotic depression. And they administered uh, treatment. But before we could treat her, we had to go to court to get a judge to determine that she was incompetent, and when, at which point then they could decide what treatment to use. Well, I called the judge, and I said, look, this lady is totally mute. She's lying in a bed in the hospital. Uh, wouldn't you like to come to the hospital and make an evaluation? And he said, absolutely not. <laughs> so I thought, OK, well, then we'll take the hospital to him. And so we put her in an ambulance, drove across town to the court, and the judge did come out to the ambulance. And it didn't take him long to decide that she wasn't competent since she was mute and wasn't talking. <clears throat> we went through the administrative procedures to give her electroconvulsive therapy, shock treatment, 
And after a few treatments, she regained her ability to speak. And at that point, she was no longer mute. She was just a cranky old lady. <laughs> but the treatment worked. So one of the things I want to emphasize to begin with in the section on medical indications is that there are lots of dementias of which Alzheimer's disease is clearly the most frequently diagnosed and often is correctly diagnosed, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes people confuse depression with Alzheimer's disease. There are all sorts of other dementias. For example, um, vascular dementias from uh, multiple infarcts that cause people to have uh, inability to function, to get confused. There is uh, a disease called Lewy bodies, which is a different type of brain disease than Alzheimer's. There's a very rare disease called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. It's a very wicked, lethal disease caused by a prion or a protein that gets into the brain and people get demented and pass away very quickly, but it's a miserable disease. It's sort of related to the so-called mad cow disease. There are many other dementias caused by vitamin deficiencies, like a B12 deficiency, and I'm not going to go through all of the list, but there is a one that I want to mention, which is Korsakoff's dementia, which is caused by uh, excessive alcoholism. And I've heard that there's a real problem like with this in Washington, D.C. <laughs> because one of the characteristics of people with Korsakoff's is that they confabulate. That means they tell stories that are false, but they believe them themselves. <laughs> and I think that must be what's going on in Washington these days. Making the diagnosis of Alzheimer's is sometimes not that easy. As Lisa Genova pointed out last week, her grandmother had Alzheimer's disease, and the family didn't know it when she was 85 years old because she had sort of compensated, masked for it. They thought she was just, you know, senile. And it turned out that she did have Alzheimer's disease. To get a clear diagnosis of Alzheimer's, you need to give a person a series of tests, possibly do brain scans, um, talk to the family members. And even then, one of the problems with making the diagnosis is that people don't want to hear it. Uh, because Alzheimer's frightens everybody, both patients and family members. The uncertainties, some of the doctors whose work I've reviewed said they always try to approach it gently and gradually explain to people that uh, that's a form of dementia that can last for a couple of years. Some people live as long as 20 years with Alzheimer's disease, and it goes through various stages. And I want to mention, by the way, that um, the real expert on Alzheimer's is in the audience, Pauli Guido, who is about to publish a book based on his PhD dissertation from UTMB on Alzheimer's disease. And I'll talk about a couple of things similar to what he mentions in his book. Once the diagnosis is made, the next problem is, who takes care of somebody that has dementia, whether it's Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia? Assuming that the dementia isn't one that can be treated, and Alzheimer's is one of those <clears throat> dementias that doesn't lend itself to treatment, you can take a couple of drugs that will slow the process of the deterioration, but it doesn't change it. It happens. The more visible symptoms of Alzheimer's are confusion, inability to find the words that you want to use. Uh, I remember my mother, who had, was demented, uh, one day called her husband because she had gone to the store and she couldn't remember how to get home. This is a very 
common symptom. People get lost even in familiar places. In their later stages, they don't really uh, necessarily rem remember who their families are or recognize people. On my mother's 91st birthday, we had a party for her. She was living then in a board and care facility. And um, I need a drink when I start talking about my mother. <laughs> it's only water, but it could be vodka. <laughs> we gathered all of her relatives from the, all, all around California. There were half a dozen people that she'd known all of her life. And we got there, and she knew that the party was uh, for her. She didn't recognize anybody except me, sort of. I mean, and it was really a sad event because people would go up to her and she would, she would act like she knew them, but she would then say, who's that? Who's that? So these are some of the kinds of evidence, diagnostic evidence that somebody has Alzheimer's or other kinds of dementia. For doctors, the problem is if you can't cure, what can you do? You have to provide comfort and provide support, but <clears throat> doctors don't routinely spend 24 hours a day taking care of patients. With Alzheimer's disease, one of the problems is that people wander. Um, there's a well-known philosopher who got Alzheimer's disease, and he would get up at 3 in the morning, get his briefcase, and head for the office. And finally, his wife figured out the only way she could keep him from wandering away at any time of night or day was to lock the doors from the outside, which worked at least for a while. I have a question for you. How many of you have an advanced directive? Uh-huh. <laughs> that uh, a document that tells your doctor and your family what your preferences are with respect to end-of-life care if you've been diagnosed with a terminal condition or an irreversible condition like Alzheimer's disease in its late stages it's, it is, is a terminal condition. I guess I'm going to have to give a little quick lecture about advanced directives. In Texas, there are two types of advanced directives. One is called a directive to physicians, in which you simply stipulate, if you've been diagnosed with a terminal or irreversible condition, what you would want near the end of life. And there are two choices. One choice is to say, I don't want life-sustaining procedures like respirators <clears throat> or artificial nutrition and hydration. And the other choice is, I want everything done to keep me alive, basically as long as possible. So let, let's call the first option the personal autonomy approach where you get to say what you would want, even though you couldn't speak for yourself at that point. The second option I will call the vitalist approach. This is the idea that human life is sacred, regardless of its quality. That's a quotation from the Missouri Supreme Court in the case of Nancy Cruzan. So if you had an advanced directive, you would choose one of those two options and then give it to your physician, your family, your friends. I don't actually recommend that as your first choice. The better option is what's called a medical power of attorney for health care. How many of you have a medical power of attorney for health care? Uh, out of this group, we're about 10%. So when you leave today, you will have some very valuable information. You can get copies of advanced directives from your lawyer, from uh, the Texas Medical Association that has it online. 
from me if you want to. I'll, I'll make copies for you. Because everybody in this room should have an advanced directive. The reason that everybody in this room should have an advanced there's nobody here under 18 as far as I can tell. So if you're under, over 18 and legally competent at the time that you make a directive, that will provide evidence of your preferences. That's the second box. Because when we make a, an evaluation in clinical ethics about what to do in a situation involving a patient that's demented, one of the first things after the diagnosis is made is to find out what are their preferences. And some people who uh, are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, even at the time they're diagnosed, may not have very many symptoms, and they are competent to make an advanced directive. Any, everybody in this room, I'm sure, that hasn't done that is competent to sign a directive to your physicians, or better yet, execute a medical power of attorney. Medical power of attorney is simply the person that you designate who would make decisions for you if you become incompetent at some point in the future. Somebody you trust can be a family member, can't be your doctor that takes care of you, but it can be anybody that you trust, a friend, a cousin, a close family member. And in my mother's case, I was her medical power of attorney. I knew from talking with her over the years that she did not believe in life-sustaining treatment. In fact, my mother was so uh, ardent about this that she believed in assisted suicide. And I thought that was a little extreme for her, but uh, I was once giving a talk to the American Psychoanalytic Association, and we were talking about assisted suicide and euthanasia, and I, and I said, well, you know, I'm, I would never really participate in euthanasia especially for a close family member, because, you know, we all have unconscious feelings of negative feelings, maybe even hate for close family members. And if you were to participate in your euthanasia, you might get too much pleasure out of it. <laughs> and then you'd feel really guilty. My mother was in the audience, and she told me afterwards, she said, I almost got up and said, if you get that much pleasure out of it, I wouldn't let you. <laughs> I'm serious, though. Everybody should have an advanced directive. So if you don't take away anything from my talk other than that, and you don't have one, get it. Because walk out on the street here with the traffic, next thing you know, you could be in the emergency room with a brain injury. And that also causes dementia in many cases. I'm going to tell you about one of the most unusual cases of Alzheimer's dementia. Who remembers Janet Adkins? Janet Adkins was a 56-year-old woman from Oregon. She was a musician. She was a writer. She was very talented. And she went to her doctor, and the doctors told her that the reason that she was having trouble reading music is that they'd done an evaluation that she had Alzheimer's disease in its very early stages. Janet Atkins was not somebody to take these matters lightly. She got on a plane, flew to Michigan, and consulted with Jack Kevorkian. And this was before Jack Kevorkian had ever assisted any suicide. And he, he talked to Janet Atkins and said, well, you know, you, the, your doctor said you've got early diagnosis of Alzheimer's, but, you know, go back and talk to your doctors and see what they can do for you. That was the last time Kevorkian showed any restraint. She came back nine months later. Her husband and her son came with her. And she was his first assisted suicide. She did not want to wait for anything further to happen. 
She was exercising her autonomy preemptively before things even got bad. You may have seen in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago an article about an elderly lawyer who had a medical power of attorney. This gentleman had a medical power of attorney and he designated his wife as his agent to make decisions for him if he became incompetent. And he said specifically, if I ever get Alzheimer's disease and don't recognize anybody or don't make sense when I talk, I don't want you to feed me or give me anything to drink, much less artificial nutrition and hydration. Now, he's 88 years old right now. I, I, I actually discovered in my research that when you get over 90, Alzheimer's disease is less frequent than it is for people in their 70s and 80s. So if you get up to 90, you can sort of rest easy. <laughs> but his, his advanced directive, again, another example of maximum autonomy, uh, provoked every bioethicist that I could think of being, except for me, was interviewed by the New York Times saying, is this okay? Can he do this? Can he make this kind of advanced directive? And there's nothing in the law that says you can't say you wouldn't want to be given food and water if you had you know, uh, become incompetent as a result of Alzheimer's disease. It's patient preferences at the maximum. Janet Atkins and this elderly lawyer. But not everybody knows what they would want. In fact, it's not that easy to project yourself at point <coughs> A, even if you've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, to know exactly what you would want all the way down the line. Although, uh, I'm going to talk about the really most difficult situation, and that's very late stage dementia uh, as a result of Alzheimer's disease. If a person goes through the various stages of increasing symptoms of an evidence of incompetence because of delusions, hallucinations, of behavioral problems. It can be all sorts of things. Not, not a, every brain is unique. Every patient is unique. Uh, some of the symptoms of Alzheimer's are you know, commonly found, but not everybody has all of them. But if you get to the late stage of Alzheimer's disease, and you become unable to talk, unable to swallow, unable to relate to other people. And I'm thinking here now of a, of a gentleman that I met in Galveston at a nursing home. And his wife was also in the nursing home. He did have late stage Alzheimer's disease but she would go up to his room every day, dress him in a, in a suit and tie and a hat, and he would just sit there. At first, he would, before he got into the very late stages, he would just shake hands with whoever came by, and he would act as though he knew them, although he didn't really know them. Uh, and then as he got worse, he just sat there. And the question arose. When somebody is in that stage and doesn't feed themselves, can't be fed, can't swallow, do you provide artificial nutrition and hydration by surgically implanting a tube directly into the stomach? And we had conversations with his wife. She was vacillating about what to do. And then she, unfortunately, passed away before he did. And 
that same problem came up. His guardian that was appointed for him had to make a decision what to do. What do you think should be done if somebody's in that very late stage? Well, if they, if they believe in personal autonomy, they would have told you in advance. But that conversation didn't occur. The tension arises because the temptation, and this, I will tell you, used to be a problem that has become less of a problem. But it used to be the case that when somebody in a nursing home reached a point where they couldn't swallow and they were uh, incapacitated, the nursing home would call up the gastroenterologist, and the gastroenterologist would come out and place a peg tube in their stomach. I was on the ethics committee of the American Gastrological Association for five years, and during that five-year period, we finally convinced them that this was not a good idea, that you shouldn't just automatically uh, place a peg tube. Now, still thinking about this elderly gentleman, I want to tell you about another situation that I consulted on. One of my colleagues asked me to... Uh, visit his mother-in-law. She was a patient in a board and care home here in Houston. And she had been a professor, was very talented. But by this time, she had Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I went to the nursing home, and I was introduced to her. We talked. We talked about her cat. and. Um, Five minutes later, I came back, and I was introduced again because she hadn't remembered me from the previous conversation. Um, I was told that this would happen, and that was absolutely correct. She'd been put into the board and care facility because when she was living alone by herself, she would just wander out into the street and sort of bring anybody she met into the house, uh, which wasn't a really a great idea. One of the things that I was asked to do <coughs> was to talk to the people at the board and care facility and enter into an agreement on behalf of the family that if she no longer could take food by mouth or drink, or swallow, that she would not be sent off to the hospital to have a tube implanted or have a gastroenterologist come to the house, to the board and care facility and do it. That, uh, they would provide comfort care, palliative care, keep her comfortable, but not take that last step. Molly uh, Guido, in his forthcoming book, takes an even stronger position. He says that if he ever had late-stage Alzheimer's disease, not only would he refuse food and water, which is pretty amazing for somebody from Guido's restaurant, <laughs> but he says he wouldn't want to have artificial nutrition and hydration, and he would want to have what in, he calls palliative sedation. That is, sedation which would uh, render him unconscious, but not euthanasia, not that, that the sedation would be a terminal uh, injection, but rather keep him from uh, displaying any form of discomfort and to make it easier for his family to bear. And he told me the other day, and I think it's okay for me to repeat this, isn't it, that he, he was talking to a physician in New York who takes care of Alzheimer's patients and, and was okay with the idea of somebody refusing nutrition and hydration. But when Paulie went on to say that he wanted people to get palliative sedation, the doctor balked at that, saying that, that that's not palliative. That's like euthanasia. Well, it's... it's Close, but it's not the same. Euthanasia is what you can get in the Netherlands, which is a lethal injection. You can get it if you're competent and if you ask for it. In the United States, euthanasia is a crime. And so you can't get euthanasia uh, very effectively, certainly not publicly. And so this is, but these are, this is a problem at the end of life because if somebody is a vitalist, or they have expressed a preference to be kept alive as long as possible, 
then one of the things that would happen is that you would get artificial nutrition and hydration that would keep you alive at least maybe a little bit longer, not always the case. So we have Janet Atkins at one extreme and the lawyer with the medical power of attorney. At the other extreme, we have people who've never said what their preferences are, who've never had an advanced directive, and never told their family members because nobody wants to think about their own death, at least not for very long. And we often have people in the hospital in Galveston and other places where I have uh, consulted who nobody knows exactly what their preferences are. Uh, in our book on clinical ethics, we take the position that if somebody is so compromised that, they, that their quality of life is so diminished, profoundly diminished, then it is not an ethical obligation to use life-sustaining procedures. Somebody can't talk, can't relate to people, doesn't have any interaction. It's very close to, although not quite, the same as somebody that's in a vegetative state like Terry Schiavo or Nancy Cruzan. Um, so late-stage Alzheimer's disease is one step away from being in a vegetative state, but it's not the same. Well, if somebody has never expressed their preferences, we take the position, and I support this, that, it, that a quality of life at that point is so diminished, life isn't worth living any longer. Now, on the other hand, if somebody is a vitalist and they have um, uh, expressed their views that they want to be kept alive as long as possible, Mrs. Nicolosis from Friendswood had her husband was in a vegetative state at home for five years. She took him to St. Luke's. While he was at St. Luke's, uh, he didn't have a respirator. He was just getting artificial nutrition and hydration. He had a neur neurological complication. They had to put him on a respirator. And the doctors at St. Luke's told Mrs. Nicolosis that this really isn't appropriate any longer. I mean, it, it's too... It's, there's no quality of life to left to preserve. And she said, well, no. I want him kept alive as long as possible. With the help of an attorney, she was able to get her husband transferred to a facility in San Antonio that would take care of him, where the same problem happened all over again. And he eventually passed away. But if somebody is a vitalist and they've made their preferences known, this creates lots of problems. Uh, one of them is pays for it. The Institute of Medicine has recently published a report on dying in America and the amount of money we spend taking care of people in intensive care units or uh, with life support in the last month of life is astronomical. It's about something like what 45 percent of the Medicare budget that's a lot of money. But I wrote an article once in 1993, which I said, if somebody really is a vitalist and they want to be kept alive as long as possible, it's fine with me as long as they've paid for it in advance with a rider on their insurance policy. So those of you that are vitalists, feel free to do that. Those of you who are, believe in personal autonomy, you better get yourself an advanced directive and or preferably a medical power of attorney so that in the future your family or whoever's taking care of you will know what to do and what not to do. Uh, so I've talked about medical indications, patient preferences. Let me just spend a few minutes talking about quality of life. What we should be doing for people with dementia as long as they're able to enjoy simple pleasures, is help them enjoy simple pleasures. Maintain their quality of life as long as possible in the best possible way. And, and I, I, I will finish with a, 
well, what happened with my mother after she was, uh, after her birthday party, actually during her birthday party. My mother was a person over the years who had been very critical of anybody that was overweight. However, in her last years, she became quite heavy, even heavier than my grandmother, who she used to criticize all the time, because the only pleasure she was really getting out of life was eating. And at her birthday party, she had six desserts. <laughs> and she was happy. I mean, she used to watch TV, but she would just make up stories because she didn't really know what was going on on the TV. But at that birthday party, she did express by her behavior her preferences, and she was well cared for. Uh, although six months later, I got a call. She was in a hospital, the emergency room, and the emergency room doctor said to me, uh, we have your mother here, and we see that you're her medical power of attorney. Uh, we can, we can you know, give her nutrition and hydration. We can keep her alive uh, for a while although the situation is pretty grim, uh, or we don't have to do that. And in fact, the doctor said to me, I recommend that we don't do that and that we give her some drugs to make sure that she's comfortable, that she's not feeling any pain, because she was obviously uh, a little agitated. And I said that that's exactly what she would want. And then she was transferred to a unit in the hospital, and the attending doctor called. And I went through the same story with him, and uh, she died that day. It was what she wanted because she'd made her preferences known. Um, I didn't feel any problem in doing that. I was sad that she was dying, but I wasn't, I wasn't unhappy for her. I was happy for her that she didn't have to suffer and that the doctors had the presence and the courtesy to call rather than do something first and then tell me that we, I'd have to tell them to stop. They were really very good about it, and it was very impressive. So my message to you is that people with dementia can still enjoy a quality of life, and you should try to help them do that as much as possible but you should also prepare for the end in a way that re reflects that person's preferences and their values. Thanks very much. Now, we, we, have, we have time for questions, as long as you don't disagree with me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, I'd be happy to take any questions you have. No, no question is out of order. Did I see a hand? <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. So I'm confused about, uh, we, my husband and I both have both the legal documents. Yes. So are you saying it is better to have just the one, the medical power of attorney, and not? No, I'm not saying that. Uh, I'm saying if you had to choose, the medical power of attorney is better. But there, would, there are circumstances in which you might, or your husband might, be uh, at a place where you're not available, I'm, I'm assuming that you're each the medical power of attorney for each other. Well, uh, no? he's no longer the medical, medical power of attorney for me because he has Alzheimer's. Okay, well, uh, let, let's say uh, something happens to you and you're in a hospital in, uh, where, Austin, or someplace worse, out in the country, <laughs> and... <laughs> If you have a directive to physicians in your medical records, then that will be controlling. Any situation where there's any kind of conflict or disagreement, it's so much better if you have a medical power of attorney who can say it the way it's supposed to be. And here's an example. I got a call from an oncologist at UTMB when I was doing ethics consultations, and she said, you've got to come in here and come over here and convince this, this family to let me do chemotherapy. I did the surgery. We didn't get all the cancer. And so I said, OK, I'll come over, because I never believe what people tell me on the telephone. This is the whole story. <laughs> and I got there, and here's, the, here's this lady, four daughters, and the husband of one of them. And they said, he's the medical power of attorney. 
she told us and told him before she went in the hospital, I'll have the surgery. I don't want to, but I'll have the surgery. But I won't have any chemotherapy. And I said to the four daughters, I said, is this what you understand? Oh, yeah, complete agreement. I had to sit down with the, the oncologist and explain that they had the right to speak on her behalf because she had a medical power of attorney in a hospital. It's much easier if there is a person rather than a piece of paper to guide them. But there are some times when a person isn't available, so in the best of all possible worlds, you have both a directive to physicians and a medical power of attorney. And I have a second question, sure. if I might. Um, you may have read Meryl Comer's book, Slow Dancing with a Stranger, the story of her. I don't dance with strangers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> in this case, the, the stranger is all sad, so I hope you don't. But, um, to make a long story short, her husband had early onset dementia, okay. has lived for 20 years, much longer than anybody anticipated, um, causing incredible stress on everybody. And so what she says at the end of the book, which I thought was kind of stunning, and I had never thought of it before, was in her advanced directive, now that she's been through this with her husband, and by the way, she takes a 12-hour shift of care for him every single day. Um, in her advanced directive, she has made it very specific. She has this criterion when she can no longer be herself. That's when she wants food and water with help. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I've, I've seen the end of Alzheimer's, and I think that's pretty far along when you can yes, no it is. be yourself. Yes, it is. So, you know, we immediately called our attorney and said, can we do this? Because <laughs> it sounds like a great idea. Can you do that in, in the state of Texas in your advanced directive? Uh, yes, yes, Ab absolutely. The, the gentleman that was quoted in the New York Times yes. could say, I don't want anything to drink, I don't want any food. Now, uh, the law says you can do that. You would be pressured, or uh, I'll give you, this isn't a, a case of dementia, but uh, this is a similar situation where there was a an elderly gentleman, 89 years old, in the hospital. He'd been in, the, in and out of the hospital many times. His advanced directive was very clear. His wife was his power of attorney. She's sitting right there. And she said, they, they won't stop. They won't stop. And this was a, a cardiac unit. And I said, well, you're his medical power of attorney. If he doesn't want any more treatment, he's entitled to say no. The cardiologist wasn't there. We had to call him on the phone in Australia. And he said, oh, no, he'll change his mind. And I said, no, you, you don't have that authority. It's his decision. So yes, uh, and I'm, I'm not giving you legal advice because I'm not licensed to, um, to do the bad things that lawyers do in Texas. Uh, I used to be licensed in California, and I did enough bad things, I thought I wouldn't keep doing it. But yes, the law says you have a right to do that, absolutely. It's a great question, and it's very important. It is. Because you can stipulate exactly what you're willing to tolerate and what you're not willing to tolerate. And so I, I, that, I, I meant to bring copies of that New York Times article, and I don't have it with me. But uh, it, it was an article about two weeks ago, and it's a lengthy article. And it's, it's, very, it's very interesting because... Some of my colleagues in the bioethics community weren't so sure that a person at that stage of life really has retained the capacity to make that advanced pronouncement. But the, that's what the advanced directive law is all about, is getting you to say what you want in advance. Yes, ma'am. Could you clarify, there is um, a disagreement between the Uh -huh. um, how is that resolved? Um, Call me. <laughs> <laughs> because this is the easy case. Uh, every hospital has to have a procedure for dealing with ethical disagreements. And in, in, in the example that you've given, where a medical power of attorney is telling a doctor what the patient does or does not want, 
That's what the physician is legally obligated to do. Now, not every doctor is going to do that. A lot of doctors will say, oh, well, I don't, I don't do that. Well, then you can get a different doctor. Uh, in a, if the hospital is, has an ethics committee, which they, most of them do, if there's a disagreement about whether life support should be continued or not, it can be taken to the ethics committee. I mean, there's a, there's a somewhat cumbersome procedure for doing that. But as far as the law is concerned, the medical power of attorney speaks for the person for whom they are the medical power of attorney. And you or your representative can either agree or disagree with any recommendation made by a physician. Physicians can only make recommendations. They have to have informed consent before they can do something. And so in your situation, if there's a conflict, if I'm called as the ethics consultant, I have to sit down with the doctor and explain to them, you can't do this. It's not your, it's not your prerogative to override what the patient's preferences are. And that's what we say in our book on clinical ethics. Patient preferences control. Yeah, I'll put them on life support. Put a peg in, okay? Um, that's going to be a little more ugly, but the same rule applies. If they've, if, if unknown to you, you're the medical power of attorney, they've placed a peg tube in, then they say, well, we, we've put it in, we can't stop. Bunk. Uh, it's not true. If they've done something that they weren't authorized to do, not only... Uh, must they stop if you tell them to, but you have a cause of action against them. And uh, you, it's not like a lot of money is going to be involved in something like this, but really the patient or the patient representative has the legal authority to consent to or refuse any recommended procedure. And if a procedure was done without consent, it can be changed. It can be withdrawn. In an emergency life-threatening situation, uh, the emergency room does have the authority to stabilize the person that is um, uh, at risk, but they don't have the authority to continue doing things without proper authorization. So uh, we used to use it as an example, a case that occurred in, in Los Angeles, a, an elderly gentleman walked into the emergency room uh, and he's having trouble with his emphysema. And the, uh, the, the doctor said, well, we have to put you on a respirator. And uh, the, the man said, well, uh, no, I've done that before. I want to leave. Now, some doctors think that they can hold somebody because they have a life-threatening condition and treat them against their will. The only time you can do that is if it's a psychiatric emergency uh, and somebody, uh, as a result of a mental disorder, is not competent, then they can be treated temporarily for their med uh, mental condition. But this gentleman with emphysema had the perfect right to walk out the door and not be treated in the emergency room. Okay? But you're, these, are good, these are great questions. These are all very excellent questions. Other questions? I know everybody's hungry. <laughs> Maybe that's why we're not asking any more questions. <laughs> Thank you very much.